Hello and welcome to Phoenix Rising presented by Zwift, the ultimate indoor training app. Fun is fast, head to Zwift.com. Phoenix Rising is a new video podcast backed by the Phoenix Foundation where we talk to some of the greatest athletes on the planet about what motivates them, about their mindset and what makes them elite, their challenges and how they rise when they fall. And we all do. It's a look into the minds of those who have scaled the peak of human physical endeavor and what we can all learn to implement in our own lives. Episode four sees us go away from triathlon into the sport of boxing. There isn't much, you know, many sports that are more pure than boxing from a sporting perspective. And Sky Nicholson, well, she has done it all. Commonwealth champion in 2018 and fresh off what she would probably say, and she does say in this episode, was a disappointing fifth at Tokyo 2021. Phoenix Foundation presents the Phoenix Rising Podcast, brought to you by Zwift, the ultimate indoor training app. Fun is fast. Head to Zwift.com. Sky, thanks for joining us on Phoenix Rising. This podcast, um, as you know, is about the athlete's journey, the highs and lows of what's required to, I guess, survive the lows and celebrate the highs and and what the reality of professional sport is. Uh, And I guess the importance for you of the same concepts upon which Phoenix is built, which is resilience and mental strength, determination and focus and and having fun as well. And I guess for your story, and it's a great one, I mean, let's start at the the beginning. I mean, how did you arrive in boxing? I mean, that's, that's a question I probably never asked you before. I mean, it's a path that's not trodden by a lot of Australian women or, or girls or, or girls in general. So, I mean, how did you arrive at, in this sport? Yeah, um, definitely didn't ever think I was going to be a boxer before I started boxing. Uh, I was a very girly girl for the most part. Um, I loved gymnastics and musical theatre and dancing and um, lots of girly sports and activities. So, um, yes, yeah, I obviously grew up around boxing. My older brother's boxed, so I... I was around the sport. It just never dawned on me that it was something that I would do. I obviously didn't have many um, female boxer role models and stuff to look up to because um, back then there there wasn't many females boxing at all. So I actually started boxing in 2008. Uh, I was 12 years old and I kind of just started going to uh, the boxing gym for fitness more than anything uh, and found that I had a bit of natural talent and um, was picking it up quicker than I would a lot of other sports that I'd tried. And, um, that was kind of my, my first kind of driving factor. And my motivation was that I'd actually found something that I was quite good at. Um, and yeah, it kind of, it, it pushed me to keep, keep going and keep getting better. And, um, that was kind of how it started and it grew into something that I absolutely loved and couldn't live without. And 150 fights and 14 years later, here I am. (laughs) <laughs> I guess, and it's interesting you say that because obviously you, you say you grew to love it, right? So you've got, but you've got to get in the ring first, and you've got to keep coming back the next day, and the next day after that, and the next day after that. And Phoenix obviously tries to expose kids to a lot of different sports so that they could find that passion. But what in that initial period when before you really loved it and it became a science, and you got to that level, what what kept you coming back in? Was it the motivation of the I'm I'm quite good at this, or you got good feedback? Or was there something about the purity of it that initially appealed to you? I think um, I found the boxing training itself um, gave me an outlet. Um, It was, I guess, a way to just let off steam. And um, I always, I always remember like leaving training, feeling so much happier and um, like all these endorphins and and good feelings would come after I'd train and, um, I started noticing that. And then on days where I didn't feel like training or I felt tired from school, um, I'd kind of remember that feeling of how I'd feel after training. And it would, it would kind of drive me to keep going. And um, I'm so glad it did because it's obviously um, become such a big part of my life. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful that um, at such a young age, I, I could find something that I would love so much even now as an adult. I was de- I'm just in my head while you were saying that I was debating whether I was going to ask this question. Tell us about the first time you got punched in the face because for me that would be the dr- that would be the main driver. I'd be like training, 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 great, training's great. Someone punches me in the head. I'm like, you know what? It's not for me. So, what well, I mean, yeah. what happened then? The first time you got properly properly knocked or properly hurt. I mean, how did you respond? You would have still been very young. Um, I don't remember the the first like actual punch where I 
you know, was like, whoa. Um, but I do remember in the early stages. Um, so when I started boxing, there was like a group of us. They were all boys, obviously, um, and me, um, all around the same age and weight. Um, and we all kind of started out around the same time together. So we kind of were progressing through the stages um, of learning how to box together. So um, like my biggest motivating factor was to keep up with the boys and be as good as the boys. So uh, when we started doing more partner work and, and sparring activities, um, I wanted to prove that I was as good as the boys. And I think that's, um, I guess, what drove me to um, like bite down and, and have a crack and and not um, I guess be scared um, I kind of like I just wanted to prove that I could do what the boys were doing and um, early on I definitely remember there were a few sparring sessions where I would feel so frustrated and almost upset with myself if I wasn't boxing well um, it wasn't so much the fact of getting hit like that didn't really bother me it would it was definitely more um, performance based if I was upset or um, disappointed in a, in a sparring session it would usually come down to me not doing um, like a good enough job and like having that expectation on myself right from really early on like from 12 years old I I kind of had that expectation of myself and um, yeah I didn't really ever find myself getting upset from getting punched like getting hit or getting hurt it was more um, that I wanted to prove that I was as good as the boys so one of the boys was getting it over me and sparring. I'd I would be upset because of that more than the actual hits, if that makes sense. It was more that I just wanted to keep proving to everyone that um, I could keep up with the boys and I was as good as the boys. It's funny that you say that, and and, and I guess in some ways um, there's a huge push now, and it's awesome to see that you know women's sport. Uh, you know, we have a lot of triathletes. Triathlon has the same prize money, the same race distances, the same everything. Other sports are moving into that slowly. Some are slower than others, but. What I do notice is that, and it's the same for my five-year-old. I mean, she's the only female rugby player in her team full of boys. And she was scared yeah. shitless, basically. When she first started, she was like, I'm not, I don't want to do this. And then, like, by week three, she was like, I'm going to dominate everyone. Like, I'm going to show everyone exactly how much better I can be than them and faster and stronger and all this kind of stuff. And it's great for her confidence. And, and yeah. I think having something to prove against the men is a big driver of why women's sport is improving so quickly in the last yeah. 10 or 20 years. I mean, and, and you're probably at the, at the forefront of that, but even team sports mm -hmm. and everything else. I mean, women's sport as a ge in general has something to prove, but also individually yeah. women are like, we can do everything that the, the men can do. And I guess you use that as a big motivation going through the, those, those early years. Yeah. Definitely, 100% agree. Um, I think girls definitely feel like they've got more to prove, especially in male-dominated sports. So um, I think that's where you can really see those breakthroughs in in those girls um, in the early years. Um, just really, like, try to break those barriers and, and keep up with the boys and um, be better than the boys. Like, that, that, that's their goal. So um, I think it's awesome and I think so many great female athletes have probably been through the – like very similar situations and expectations on themselves. You touched on it before. I mean, tell us about your brother and his journey, well, both your brothers, but specifically Jamie, obviously, because he was the, the one with the, the boxing pedigree and what he actually achieved and, and then, you know, obviously what occurred after that. Yeah, so um, unfortunately two of my brothers passed away in a car accident um, a year and a half before I was born, so we never met. Um Jamie was 22 and Gavin was only 10. Um, when I was born a year and a half later, mum and dad were very happy that I was a girl and I would never kind of be compared to Jamie and Gavin or um, I guess expected to do the things that Jamie did, especially um, obviously being a, a world medalist, Commonwealth Games medalist, Olympian, um, there would be pretty big shoes to fill. Um, Turns out I was exactly like both of them. Uh, Gavin was very into all the musical theatre and um, loved musicals and everything, which was where exactly where I was as well um, until I found boxing at 12 um, and then obviously went down the exact same path Jamie went down. And uh, I think growing up in my household, uh, hearing about the amazing things they did and um, their lives constantly being celebrated um, within my family, I, I think they've both been huge role models and 
uh, inspirations in my life and in everything that I've chosen to do. Um, especially Jamie, obviously with the boxing stuff, I feel like he's been such a, a supportive role um, for someone who I've never met. Um, just the comfort in knowing that everything I'm doing in my boxing, he's traveled that path and he, I guess he's led that path for me. And um, it's definitely been, yeah, very comforting knowing that uh, everything I'm doing and, and everything I'm achieving, he's been there and done that. And yeah, it's a really cool feeling. Um, it, it's, it's like boxing, ha I've said this before, but it's like boxing has um, given me a relationship with Jamie, um, a brother that I, I unfortunately never got to meet. So yeah, I feel like I know him and um, I can resonate with him in everything that I do because I know that he's been been here and traveled the same path. It's, it's pretty cool. It's it's really cool, um, and I, and I'm I'm imagining that from the age of twelve, you probably and as you progress through the ranks, you probably had your fair share of naysayers throughout. Uh, you had to probably blaze a little bit of a trail yourself for female boxers. You know, people probably told you, and I don't know, but tell me if people told you, you know, there's no future in this for you. You should be focusing on other things, whatever, or if that ever happened, or whether it was all supportive. And if that did happen, you probably. You know, you have Jamie sitting on your shoulder, having mm -hmm. having trodden that path. I mean, did you probably no doubt drew strength from that? If, if indeed you yeah. did come up against those kind of attitudes. So I think um, at first, even mum and dad, like I think they thought it was a bit of a phase that would fizzle out, like all my other sporting endeavours up until that stage. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I remember, I think I was in grade nine. I'd probably been boxing about a year. Um, going on sunrise sunrise asked me to come on um the news and there was a big debate about should girls be allowed to box um and i just remember being so confused by that and couldn't understand why it was even a topic um and i basically went on there to prove that if i can do it so can other girls um but yeah i remember people like i think it was jeff fennick or someone um going on there saying girls shouldn't box my daughter will never be allowed to box and there was quite a lot of um like negativity around it uh but I think when women's boxing got announced into the Olympic Games in 2012 um numbers and interest in the sport definitely started to grow um female boxing um has been on the rise ever since and uh the numbers the talent the skill that you see now in female boxing is just amazing and it's constantly getting bigger and better and um I think when I watch boxing especially at the even at these most recent Olympics like the most exciting fights were the female fights um uh I think we've 100 percent well and truly paved a way and it's only going to get better and better and um, we're obviously still such a young sport in terms of being just the females and um, like I'm excited to see the future of women's boxing and um, female sport in general. So six six years after you start, uh, you arrive on the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. I mean, that was I mean for a lot of people that was the first time maybe that they would have seen you box, heard your name. Uh, obviously, in boxing circles, you're well known before then. But tell us about that journey at home uh, on the Gold Coast, walking away on you know with a with a Commonwealth gold. I mean, like. When you when you remember that, what what do you what springs to mind first? Uh, definitely standing on the podium um, <laughs> and seeing the Australian flag being raised and the national anthem, um, and just like the whole crowd, like all of my family and friends were there. Everyone I knew was there. Um, was just like the most like rewarding feeling. Um, years of hard work and sacrifice and missed social events and. Uh, travel away from family, missing birthdays. And um, yeah, it just, it all paid off in that moment. I just f had so much like feeling of pride. Uh, I just felt so proud to be uh, representing such an amazing country, of course, but also representing my family name um, and women's boxing as well. And um, being that role model and that inspiration for that next generation of girls was um so amazing like honestly highlight of my life was being on that podium in on the gold coast did you because jamie won a 
He brought a bronze, right? So he, he's a Commonwealth medalist as well. Did you think about him yeah. when you were standing on that step? I did. Um, Jamie got bronze at the Commonwealth Games in Auckland, 1990. Don't quote me. Um, I think that's right. I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> um, so he was clearly winning his semi-final bout against um, England and the referee kept pulling him up saying he was holding. Um, holding and pulling him back um, where he wasn't at all. He was clearly winning. I've watched the fight. <laughs> um, clearly outboxing this boy and he was getting so frustrated and he noticed that the referee kept um, pulling up Jamie for what he was doing. So it was quite tactical by him, uh, but he kept holding Jamie and pushing against Jamie so it looked like um, Jamie was pulling back, if that makes sense. It's hard yep. to explain without showing you footage. But um, the referee actually ended up disqualifying Jamie um, and the English boy went on to win the gold medal. Um, so there was a pretty big uproar and there was a lot of controversy around it all. And um, usually if you get disqualified, you don't, you're not even presented with your medal. But um, because it was such an un, like unjust, unfair situation that occurred he still got his medal and and everything else but I just remember um when I was uh gearing up getting ready for my semi-final bout at the Commonwealth Games my older brother Alan um he whispered in my ear and he said they robbed Jamie of his gold medal so when you go and get that gold medal get it for him too and I just like that really stuck with me and um I felt like I really, like I won that gold medal for both of us and um, justice was served a little bit that day. I felt um, bringing that gold medal home for our family. Oh, I feel emotional hearing that. Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm really glad I asked yeah. that. That's a, that's a, that's an amazing story. I, I didn't know that about, uh, I knew we had the bronze, but, you yeah. know, nowhere, you can't research on the internet the injustice of the 1990 yeah. Commonwealth Games semifinal. It's not there, <laughs> you know, it's pre-internet days. So, yeah. you know, like, I mean, I, and I no doubt you would have felt the pressure there and, and obviously, yeah. you know, I, I, what happened after that? Because I, get, I guess a lot of athletes, they, 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 they train and they sacrifice like we talked about and then they go and they win or they come second or whatever. Um, <laughs> and then it's awesome for a week and then they're like, ah, oh, what's, where, where yeah. am I now? You know, like, what, what do I, but like you're luck, luckily you had the Olympics what we thought would be two years later. Obviously, that's a, yeah. another goal to climb. But because you had that legacy aspect, did you, did you avoid having that emptiness feeling afterwards that is so often reported by athletes who have worked towards a goal and achieved it? I um, Obviously, being my first major event, um, I wasn't really prepared for it. Um, I actually ended up going travelling a few weeks after the games um, over to the US uh, where my sister lived. So um, it was good to just be surrounded by family away from all the boxing stuff um, and just kind of switch off mentally. And um, I found that I didn't really struggle too hard um, with the come down that they call it um, after such a big event, uh, mainly because there was a world championships in the November of the same year. So I did kind of have, um, enough time to switch off, reset, um, and then pretty much get straight back into training and have that new goal not too far away. Um, so I think that was definitely a, um, a blessing, um, having that that World Championships at the end of that year. It kind of gave me um, a new goal, obviously, and um, a new focus. So I, I didn't fall into too much of a slump, which was good. Which sort of brings me to the same situation you're sitting in right now, um, which obviously, first of all, where you're sitting, I mean, not if people are listening to this on the podcast version, they can't see the, the, the Simpsons picture behind you, which <laughs> is, is you and your partner and your dog. But if you're watching the video one, I mean, if you, know, if you listen to the podcast, go to the YouTube version because it's <laughs> worth, and speaking of where you're sitting in space, but where you're sitting in time is kind of the same as, yeah, look at that. Oh, that's so lovely. <laughs> That's, I thought I was saying, we were saying before we started recording that I feel like that was the present that he would give to you and claim as that he was giving it to you, but really to himself. And then it turns out it was the other way around. I did, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> that is that is excellent. I get socks and undies and stuff. 
Um, but that is that is far superior. Um, but in terms of ways, well, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. Um, <laughs> But in time-wise, you're kind of in the same situation in that you've got another thing to look forward to. But what's different about it is obviously the result was different when we when we talk about Tokyo. You had to, you were, like everyone else, 11,000 others, you were forced to wait another extra year. Um, yeah. And the build-up to the Olympics is obviously far and away greater than the Commonwealth Games in terms of where you place it in your mind, I imagine, having never been to an Olympics. Um, but it's, a, it's the biggest deal there is. Um, and then it was your turn to, I suppose, and I, it's, I'm going to ask you this question because last time we spoke was right after the Olympics and I was going to say, you know, it was you was on the other side of an injustice. Do you feel still like it was potentially that kind of thing because it was close, it was a split decision, it was 3-2, you look like you're on top, you got, you got, you got, you know, you got robbed on a split decision at the end. That's what people thought. Yeah. Do you still think that and how, how, where is it mentally in your head when you look back on it now? Have you turned it into motivation already? Um, I've watched it back a few times and I feel like the more I've watched it back, the more I can see why people thought I won um, and that it was an injustice. Uh, I felt at the time it was so close that it could have gone either way. Um but in saying that, I also feel like what's meant to be will be. And I've kind of always lived by that. Um, and there's no point dwelling on something that can't be changed. Um, all I can do is learn from the experience as best as I can and use it to fuel me for what's next. And um, I think it's definitely been a big uh, motivator for me. Um, it's kind of given me a taste of how close I was to an Olympic medal, potentially an Olympic gold medal, um, which has been my dream since women's boxing um, has been in the Olympic Games since 2012. So um, I feel like if anything, it's just made that push for gold in 2024 um, so much bigger for me. Uh, I... I have struggled and gone into a bit of a slump Post Olympics, uh, I think a lot of that would be to do with not getting the result that I went for. Um, but in saying that, we can learn a lot more from our losses than we can from wins a lot of the time. So, um, really, just trying to make sure that I'm an even better, more well-rounded athlete um, come the next major event. Talk to talk to us about what that slump looks like. Obviously, you came home. You had to do 14 days of isolation. That's never helpful when you have come home uh, regardless, but especially after, uh, you know, narrowly missing out on an Olympic medal. Like for anyone who doesn't know, obviously you lost a quarterfinal, it was a split decision and, you know, and we'll talk about the press conference and all that stuff in a minute, but that's when people really got to know you as a human. Yeah. Um, but then you've got to do 14 days and then you go home and it's all over and it's this thing that is just sitting there it has just happened. So, and I think... You know, Phoenix is a lot about, it's about highs, but it's about lows and the resilience you show during those periods too. So how did you cope with it? Did you allow yourself to have days where you're just like, I can't be bothered to do anything and just honoured those feelings? Or did you yeah. fight against them constantly? No, you know? um, I found that I did. I really have had to listen to my body and listen to my mind um, and try to be kind to myself. Um, I obviously have never been through this before. I haven't been to an Olympic Games and I've, I haven't felt the feelings that I've felt coming back from the Olympic Games before. So I really have tried to be um, kind to myself and listen to my body. Um, there have been days where I haven't trained, I haven't got out of bed or um, I've spent the day eating junk food and just thought, treat yourself. Um, but there's also been those moments where I think about what happened at the Olympics and how badly I don't want that to happen again um so I'll force myself into the gym and train and train and train and train and train um so it's been like a little bit of a roller coaster there's been really really good positive days um where I've had amazing training sessions and my diet's been perfect and everything else and then there's been really low days where I 
haven't wanted to do anything and I'll watch Netflix all day and eat ice cream. Um, so yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster for me, um, and trying to find a balance somewhere in between so that, <laughs> um, it's not this constant up and down. Um, but, uh, the world championships getting confirmed, um, late last week, they've been confirmed for, uh, December, early December, um, has kind of been that kick up the butt that I almost needed, um, to say, all right, let's get back into elite athlete mode. Um, you've been kind to yourself. You've had the break you needed. Um, you've had the rest days you needed. You've had the training days you needed. And now it's time to get back into that routine. Um, set that focus on that gold medal at the world championships and like, let's go, it's go time. Um, which is kind of where I've been at this week. So it's so far been a very positive week. Um, I feel like I'm starting to feel myself again and, and get back to, um, elite athlete sky so now uh, yeah. it's it's really good to hear that because i mean it doesn't matter who you are like if you have any goals whether it be like oh, i want to do an ironman or i just want to do this thing or i want to you know train for, if you're training for anything like there's seasons like i feel like there's seasons where there's times when you're like super motivated and you're going to make all these gains but then sometimes you just go off it and people beat themselves up so badly about it like i missed this thing or i missed one thing i'm i'm done you know, I give up, like, you've got to kind of ride out the, like, just the human parts of it. And I, and I think that you, no one experiences a low grader, I suppose, than, than elite athletes do, especially around the Olympic Games, because there's so much time in between. However, it's not that much time, right? So there's less time. And in my head, I'm like, right, okay, so this happened to you. There was no crowds there. Tokyo, meh, nah, Paris, full of people, awesome have already experienced the other side of it. It just, it yeah. seems like a script. Like, I mean, I could write a movie script around it. That, that's, that, mm -hmm. for me, I'm like, that's, that's where you want to win a gold medal. Like, not I great, agree. Tokyo, great, Paris, outstanding. Right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I feel um, that. I, I definitely agree. I've kind of, I've had that same thought process. Like, the Tokyo Olympics was like a practice run for me, and Paris is going to be the gold medal run. So, um, I definitely do feel that way. I feel um, in terms of my age, experience and everything else as well, like everything lines up perfectly for Paris. So um, I think that's where we're going to see the stars align and, and bring home that ever elusive Olympic gold medal that we've never won for boxing in Australia. Male exactly or female. Right. Exactly <laughs> right. And, and then you think about it, you go 1990 Auckland, right, medal. 1992 Barcelona, didn't win a medal. Now you get to take this to the next step that Jamie didn't take yeah. and win a goal That's for both of you. Yeah. I'm not, like, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to storyteller mode here. I'm just thinking, oh, this is, this is what the narrative is. I'm telling you the narrative. That, that's, but that's, that's, it's that's already, to me. It's what, already written in the stars. I agree. It's already written in the stars. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm going to cash out the bank account on you. There's got to be an early market on Sky Nicholson to win 2024. <laughs> I have to look at that.